next up, we will take up House Bill 5052 by Re uh, Chairman McNamara. This bill would require, requires an insurer to provide business interruption coverage to the global pandemic COVID-19. Um, we have two witnesses here uh, on the line. We have first up Frank O'Brien from the APCIA. Uh, Frank O'Brien is signed up against it, as well as Rory Whalen, who will be right afterward. Mr. Mr. O'Brien, you are before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, for the record, my name is Frank O'Brien. I am with the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. Uh, APCIA is a national property casualty insurance company trade association. Uh, we have about a thousand member companies. We have several members located in Rhode Island, many more who do business in the state. And together, uh, we write uh, approximately 65% of the commercial property insurance that is sold in the state. I'm here to testify in opposition to House Bill 5052. Uh, like Mr. McMahon, uh, I have been before this committee uh, many times uh, over the years on various issues. This is my inaugural visit with you uh, this year. And uh, like the rest of you, I look forward to the day when uh, we'll be able to do this back in the committee room uh, in person. Uh, I have provided uh, an extensive uh, written comment uh, to the committee uh, concerning this bill, uh, but there are three basic points that I'd like to leave you with uh, this evening. First, uh, as devastating as the business losses caused by the pandemic are, unfortunately they are not covered under a standard business interruption policies. The claims do not meet the long-standing initial requirement of being related to physical damage to the insured premises, and perhaps uh, more importantly, uh, the virus exclusion that is included in many, if not all, of these policies would apply, meaning insurers are not obligated to pay for any loss or damage caused by the COVID-19 virus. I will acknowledge to you, however, that there is plenty of ongoing litigation on this issue, including at least two major cases here in Rhode Island. I would also note that of the approximately 2,000 cases that have been litigated, 98 to 99% of them are finding in favor of insurers. Second, there is a huge catastrophe catastrophic financial impact on insurers if this particular piece of legislation would pass. Where the mandated business interruption coverage is retroactive or prospectively applied, it'll cause a great deal of financial harm for the property casualty industry. Uh, many domestic Rhode Island insurers that write commercial property coverage would likely become insolvent, perhaps in a matter of months, they're forced to pay business interruption claims arising out of the COVID-19 pandemic. In short, we'd go be, we would go bankrupt and be unable to pay claims for auto accidents, fires, and other covered claims. The scope of the potential loss is that huge, and we have outlined it in detail in the paper that we have provided to you. Finally, a particular part of the bill would require us to cover these types of losses retroactively. And that particular provision is unconstitutional under both the U.S. and Rhode Island constitutions. Simply put, while the General Assembly could pass a bill, uh, we believe that it would very quickly be struck down by the courts. And we have provided a lengthy white paper uh, by a prominent Rhode Island attorney that uh, articulates uh, the various legal theories under which uh, a retroactive application as required by this particular pro proposal 
uh, would not meet uh, the requirements of either the U.S. or the Rhode Island State Constitution. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll complete my remarks and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Frank. I believe uh, Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy has a question for you. If, it, if you could put your microphone on. Uh, last week I... on, on Friday, a National Conference of State Legislatures actually held a session on pandemic insurance and we actually brought in some experts to speak directly to this uh, particular subject uh, as mr o'brien just stated um, to, to retroactively go in now and uh, and try to provide this pandemic insurance would literally bankrupt insurance companies all across america uh, i don't see how this could possibly work at this stage of the game and you know based on everything i've heard and even read from uh, the national association of insurance commissioners this would this would be just a very very difficult uh thing to uh to be able to to move forward with it at this time chairman thank you uh representative Fenton. thank you chairman um just a question for uh, our witness here. You said about like 98 to 99 percent were finding in, in cases of the insurer. What, what were the cases about that they were successful, if you know? So very few of the cases have been successful. Um, and there is um, one case out of the state of, state of Ohio in the federal district court out there which has gotten a lot of attention because in that particular case a U.S. District Court judge found in favor of a plaintiff which was a, a local restaurant and basically said that the insurance policy was uh, unclear and therefore uh, the judge found in favor of uh, the plaintiff. Uh, two other judges in that same federal district looked at the exact uh, same type of language in other insurance policies and reached the exact opposite conclusion of this particular judge. So three cases in Ohio in the U.S. District Court, two finding in favor of insurers, one finding in favor of a restaurant. Uh, across the country, most, if not all, 98 to 99 percent of the cases that have been decided have been decided in favor of insurers. Uh, I would also point out that the very first case that was filed uh, in this particular type of situation coming out of New Orleans was literally, the decision on that literally came down on Friday, and that particular case came down in favor of the insurer that uh, had provided the policy. Thank you. Whip Kazarian, do you have a question? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about these businesses who are paying in, uh, for insurance and, you know, we're all hit with this pandemic and, and they're not able to um, file any claims. And I'm just wondering, what would an insurance company be able to offer a business who has insurance with them right now for for a pandemic? Do they have anything that they can offer them? Like, is there so, oh. oh, I'm sorry, Representative. No, I, I, no I'm just, I know the, the question's um, just a little uh, broad, so I'm just trying to think of anything in particular that you could offer them. If you need clarification for my question, I'll let you answer, sorry. <laughs> no problem, that's, uh, that's a little bit of uh, the, the challenge of doing this remotely, if you will. Uh, um, <laughs> In terms, let me answer your question this way, and I'll answer it in two ways. First, uh, insurers have provided uh, some measure of help to their customers, small businesses and others, by uh, providing uh, uh, payment plans, by 
forbearing, uh, various other things, by trying to be flexible with uh, their customers. Uh, and we have also been diligent in terms of uh, trying to pay uh, the claims that have been filed that are covered under the policy um, appropriately and as quickly as we can. Um, in terms of a, of, of a larger issue, uh, and uh, Representative Kennedy alluded to this uh, a little bit in some of the comments that he made, um, there needs to be a, a, a broader, uh, large-scale solution to this. Uh, from an insurance perspective, uh, pandemics aren't an insurable event. They're just too big. So in order for there to be some sort of relief to uh, restaurants and other small businesses, both now and in the future, there really needs to be a, a federal solution. And we understand that there are a number of uh, proposals that are uh, being worked on in Congress uh, that would provide relief to small businesses, restaurants, and others. Uh, there are also a number of proposals that are being discussed that would put in place mechanisms going forward so there would be an ability to ensure this type of risk uh, going forward. So there are short, short-term solutions, short-term solutions, and more long-term discussions that are going on currently. Great. I hope that was responsive to your question. Um, yes, it was. I'm just, I, I, I'm just trying to think through the problem. Um, cause, you know, right now, I, I feel like the government is the only one that's there that's responsible or, or trying to help these small businesses and just trying to think through um, just some other options that we might have with insurance companies. So um, you did answer it, though. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Thank you, Frank. Um, are there any other questions for the witness? Thought I heard someone. All right. Um, Whip Chippendale. Thank you, Chairman. Frank, it's good to see you again, so to speak. Um, good, good to see you, uh, <laughs> Representative. We, um, I've certainly learned a lot about insurance over the last uh, six years on this, commission, on this committee, but um, I think it's important for folks to remember that the insurance companies base their rates or create their rates actuarially. They, they do this based on the likeliness of certain aspects of a policy being activated and the, the potential for loss is, is measured in that actuarial assessment. And to now say, you know, we want to also add on in case of meteor strikes, um, we're going to cover that too, obviously wasn't in the original actuarial calculation. Now, it's easy to hate the insurance industry, right? I mean, you and I don't exchange Christmas cards. It's easy to beat you guys up. But on this one here, you're a business. You sold a product. Um, we're actually seeing some insurance companies, the mutuals anyway, uh, who have reduced costs because they've incurred fewer costs themselves. People are driving their cars less, less if, they're, if they're an auto insurer, et cetera, and they're reflecting that in their rates. So I think insurance companies are doing the best they can under these uh, circumstances. But uh, I think for this bill to be enacted, clearly, uh, in addition to the constitutional challenges that you pointed out, um, would bankrupt the, the insurance industry, and people would not realize how important insurance really is until they lost it. So um, I'm on your side on this one, Frank, oddly enough. So uh, I don't think this is a good bill to pass. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, with Trippendale. Are there any other questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you, Frank O'Brien. Next up, we will take up Rory Whalen from NAMIC. We'll get him on the line. Mr. Whalen, you are before the House Corporations Committee. You may proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I will thank the, uh, Mr. O'Brien, and especially the speaker, uh, for their comments and her wholeheartedly. I have submitted written testimony, uh, so, and much of what I included in my testimony uh, has been covered. Just go to the hot point. 
and, and that is, uh, as you know, this pandemic has been absolutely devastating uh, to our state and national economy, uh, and our public policy at the federal and state level should appropriately focus on supporting individuals and small businesses by injecting capital to the stimulating job growth. Unfortunately, this bill does neither. It would establish what is really a job-crushing mandate that all business interruption insurance includes coronavirus claims. If enacted, it would impose an overwhelming burden on the insurance industry, which is a critical source of jobs and tax to, to the people of Rhode Island. Moreover, it would undermine the ability of insurers to pay legitimate claims that they are currently paying, jeopardize sovereignty of some of these insurers. While the retro, and as noted, the retroactive nature of the bill uh, would, would thoroughly be tested in courts and most likely overturned. But during that process, unfortunately, we would be wasting time and money in an that would necessarily the attention and focus from those public policies that would truly benefit violence businesses and workers. Uh, as also noted, uh, business interruption insurance in this country throughout the world uh, is not uh, modeled for pandemics such as this. Uh, the idea of, of insurance and the nature of insurance is to take a large pool and protect them uh, knowing that smaller pool would be uh, affected. In this case, virtually every American, every business has been impacted by COVID. So simply it turns that principle of insurance on its head. And lastly, I would like to note that the uh, National Association Committee uh, expressed opposition to similar proposals in other states for reasons that I uh, have cited. Likewise, the National Council of Legislators voiced similar concern, stated that both uh, that such proposals are both unconstitutional and uh, and on behalf of the members of the National Insurance Companies. I very much appreciate the team uh, and uh, thoughtful uh, deliberation on this. And I urge you to take no, no further action on this legislation. All right. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions. Ted, thank you, uh, Rory. Are there any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you. And uh, we do have written testimony that we've received from John Meats from New England Surplus Lines Association. Uh, against Timothy Grant from Lloyd's, against uh, Stephen Zubiago from Nixon Peabody, against, and we did receive testimony from Jordan Goyette in favor, and that concludes the testimony on House Bill 5052.